Ready? <laughs> We're ready. Okay. Let's get at it. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Jeremiah, we're going to be talking about uh, this other prophet that is a, um, um, a prophet that served before the captivity, uh, the final captivity, the Babylonian captivity, uh, and he even served all the way into the captivity, and uh, in fact, that was he was the last of these um, uh, prophets, if you will, that is speaking to Judah and uh, trying to encourage them to wise up and, and straighten up and do the right thing, and um, and that's what we've been talking about today in regards to leadership. So there's a few things that we can learn from from Jeremiah, but before we do that, let's kind of think through Isaiah just real quick. We talked about him last week, spent some time in his in his writings, and one of the major um, themes, or we might maybe not the major theme, but some of the two major points that he brings out over and over again in his writings and in his speaking is judgment and what else? What was the second one? Hope, right? So it's judgment and hope. So he's, his message is a message of judgment, but it is also a message of, of hope. And he speaks about the coming judgment of the Lord and, and how God is going to judge them for their disobedience, for the rebellion, for uh, their idolatry, the things that they were doing. Uh, but then he also gives a message of hope that that things are going to be different, that the future is going to be different, that the the righteous will eventually see what they deserve and the wicked will receive what they deserve. And so that that message of hope is, is strong all the way through Isaiah and uh, is a beautiful message as well. So hope and judgment, the hope of a coming king, um, not like the kings they've had in the past that have led them astray and led them into idolatry um, and have been weak, right? Even the king Hezekiah, even though he he was strong, he he redeemed Israel in a sense that he cleansed the the idol worship out and and did good things in comparison to those who came before him, but um, towards the end of his life, what was his major flaw? What did he do towards the end of his life that really sent things in the wrong direction? Do you remember? When, when the Babylonian representatives came to, to um, give gifts to the king because of his illness, what did he do when they arrived? Yeah, show them all the treasures, <laughs> right? And so when Isaiah, Isaiah comes in, he says... Um, um, you know, what'd you show him? <laughs> and he said, I showed him everything, all of the treasures, all that we have. And that little insignificant place out, you know, south of Assyria. Remember, we're dealing with Assyria at first, right? They're the big powerhouse that's coming in and they're taking the, the 10 tribes of Israel of the north. And then the Babylon, the Babylonian group hasn't quite made itself um, as powerful, but they're going to be. And at this point in time, they're just kind of there. And so they come and they see all these things. And, uh, later they're going to, they're going to come back. Um, but one of, one of Hezekiah's redeeming factors, okay, um, we have the people coming and they're conquering the, and it seems hopeless. And, and what does he do? Does he ride out on his white steed and, and go to war against the Assyri or the Babylonians? What does he do? This time it was the Assyrians. Okay, the Assyrians attack first. So what does he do? Do you remember? He hides, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't really hide, but he kind of feels like it. You know, he goes into the temple and he prays to his God. And what does God do for him? How does he defeat the, the army of the Assyrians? He sends the, the angel of the Lord who comes and conquers the 185,000 and the people flee, right? So that's kind of his redeeming um, characteristic. But nonetheless, um, there, there's still a problem. Babylon is going to be an issue for them. And um, that's kind of coming up in Jeremiah's day. And so Jeremiah is dealing with a world where the northern kingdom has been conquered. We call them the last lost tribes of Israel. And we've only got the, 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 uh, southern kingdom. So what, what two cities, if you will, nations, um, um, 
trying to think of the right word, groups are involved. Uh, they're, they're names of people. That's, the terminology is not correct, but you know what I'm saying. So there's basically two. We have two tribes. That's the word. So we have two tribes that kind of make up this southern kingdom. What are they? Judah and which other one? Benjamin, right? And so we've got these two basic southern tribes. The Babylonians are going to come, but the people are going to provoke God to send the Babylonians. And Jeremiah is going to speak to this particular uh, group of people. And so there's there's a, a message of Jeremiah's uh, book, and I think it's very similar to Isaiah's. Remember, Isaiah was judgment and hope, and Jeremiah is going to be justice and grace. Justice and grace. And it's going to make more sense as we dig through there, but Jeremiah is going to speak of the injustice that the people are constantly oppressing the poor. They're oppressing the weak. They're, they're taking advantage of people. And um, in turn, they will be the ones who were oppressed. That's going to be the message. But despite their failure, despite the fact that, that they will not listen, they will not repent, God's grace leads him to continue in his promise. He will keep his promise. He will have a new covenant. He will have a new Israel. He will keep his promise to his people, despite them, right? And that's kind of the idea of grace. He's going to extend favor to a people despite their rebellion, despite their misbehavior, despite their sin. And so let's spend some time on that. There are a few main points that I want to touch on. Jeremiah's experience um, as a leader. Uh, what some of the things we learn from this. Godly leadership can be a heavy burden. That's one thing that we learn from Jeremiah. He is very much weighted down by the burden of, of leadership, the responsibility. Um, godly leaders are people and they suffer from stress. They suffer from anxiety. They suffer from depression. Um, they're often discouraged. And that's a reality with Jeremiah, and it's a reality with, with a lot of um, leaders, God's leaders. But really, the scripture really paints that picture of Jeremiah, that he expresses his, his angst, he expresses his um, distress and concern, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and we're going to talk about the fact that even though he was faithful, <laughs> And he did what God told him to do. He preached the message that God gave him to preach. Nobody listened. Nobody listened. And so sometimes, and what we'll see in a lot of times, in a lot of cases, biblical leadership is not measured by how many people are following, but it's measured by how well the person obeyed the word of God. That Jeremiah is going to obey God, but in the end, he's not going to have followers. In fact, he's even going to express how lonely he is. His friends have rejected him. His family has rejected him. He, he never marries. He never has children. The only one he has is God, his only companion. He is alone in this mission, in this work. And the people will even attempt several times to kill him, but he will be obedient. And it's a message of leadership we don't often hear. That's why this is such a powerful book. Because a lot of times we think of leadership and we're thinking, oh, that's the guy who is leading everybody. Everybody's following him. And look how many people are following him. And he's such a great leader. And then we look at Jeremiah and he is a um, exemplifies the definition of biblical leadership. But nobody's following. <laughs> and so we today read it. And we certainly follow by example, but at this time, nobody is following him. And so hopefully that message will be clear as we read through. Let's go ahead and start in Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to kind of grasp on to some of the main ideas that we start with, his commission. So Jeremiah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 4. It says, Now the word, word of the Lord came, came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, alas, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I commend you, you shall speak. And then he says in verse eight, do not be afraid of them. 
for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So we, we don't know exactly how old he was. There's a lot of um, estimates somewhere between 17 and 20. So if you can imagine, you know, some of y'all may not have gotten to 17 and 20, but those of us who have gone through that, imagine yourself at 17. <laughs> and how prepared were you to, to do what he is going to do, to, to speak the words of God, to, to call out a nation for their um, sin? How, how prepared were you for that? <laughs> That's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, you know, that just, just feels, for some of us, feels like a lifetime ago. And it just seems so difficult to even wrap our head around the concept of, of being called at such a young age. But he was. But some of the things that are significant about him is that God foreknew his faithfulness. He foreknew that he would be the man for the job, that he would be the right person to accomplish this task. You know, even before he was born, God knew he would be the one that would accomplish and be able to handle this. Now, think about that for a minute. He's able to to handle the stress and the difficulty of bearing such a difficult message. Um, you know, I have I can't even think in my mind how many ministers I have have seen, you know, go and, and go out into the ministry and they last one or two years and they're off doing something else. They, they kind of, you go in with this mindset and this idea, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, a bed of roses, I guess. I, you know, it's going to be easy, right? It's an easy work. They're going to support me. It's going to be easy. And then you get into your first work and, you know, there's that old, um, running joke that talks about, um, you know, you go in to conquer the world and you almost get fired for changing the bulletin uh, board. You know, there, there's this whole idea that you you have this expectation and it becomes you find it's difficult. And, and a lot of guys have a hard time with the burden of that. They didn't expect it. And so you can certainly see that God saw in Jeremiah before he was born that he could handle um, such a difficult task to bear the message um, to the people of God. So Jeremiah's calling is based on foreknowledge. Look at verse 9. It says, Then the Lord stretched out his hand, and he touched my mouth. Remember remember Isaiah? What, what happened to his mouth? Well, how was he commissioned? The coal, right? The seraphim came and, and touched the hot coal to his lips and purified him. You know, he, he was a man of unclean lips, and now he's a man of, of clean lips. He will speak the word of God. Similar idea, the Lord touches his mouth, and he said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations, over the kingdom. And now this is important, to pluck up and to break down. So to, to tear up or to rip up and to, to break down, that's going to be the, um, the purpose of the message, to destroy and to overthrow, but also to build and to plant. So there, there's this uh, twofold portion here. We, we have God uh, enacting justice, and he is going to come, and he's going to do what he needs to do to deal with the people of oppression. He's going to oppress them. But then there is going to be a message of, of building and planting new, um, and that whole idea of tilling the soil, getting things ready for something new, um, can be imagined as we think about that. All right, so Jeremiah chapter 7. I know I'm moving really fast through this first section because I want to get to some of the where the um, the message kind of speaks to where I want it to go, and then we'll spend some time talking about it. But Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, this is a really powerful section of the book because what Jeremiah is doing, and what you may not know about Jeremiah, is he's actually a priest. Um, the problem with his priesthood is way back in the time of Solomon, um, the family, his family, his lineage was removed from being priests. They were banned from the temple. And so he has come from a lineage of priests, but he has never, his people have never been allowed to serve in the temple. And so you have to imagine that the current priests are going to look at him and they're going to think, you know, this guy is an outcast. He has no business being here. He has no business speaking. He is of a family of outcasts. But 
Jeremiah finds himself right at the temple gate. And that's where this sermon takes place, the temple sermon of Jeremiah. So look at verse one. It says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord. All you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. So you can imagine how he must have felt, <laughs> you know, just standing in front of the temple. He's never been allowed to serve in the temple, although in different circumstances he may have served in the temple. But he's not allowed to serve in the temple. But God is having him stand outside the temple and preach a message of um, really condemnation for those who are coming in and, and claiming to worship God, walking through the gates. Look at verse 3. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust the deceptive words. Now, listen to the deceptive words. <laughs> this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Those are the deceptive words. Isn't that odd? Because where are they? Standing right in front of the temple of the Lord. <laughs> you know, so the, it begs the question, you know, why would these be deceptive words? What makes the temple the temple of the Lord rather than just a building? What do you think? His presence, right? God's presence. And, and what was so special about Israel anyway? From the very beginning, we, we hear this message that I will have a people, they will have, a, they, you know, they will be my people, my possession. You know, you can read all the way through the first five books of the Bible and hear that message over and over again that God is, is going to have a, a people. But what is he going to do with them? I mean, is he going to just be kind of an absentee owner and, and off somewhere else and kind of looking in the distance and hope things work out? What does God promise that he will do with these people? That he will come and be with them, dwell with them, that his name will be with them in the temple and his presence will be there. But then we have sin and we have um, idolatry taking place in the people's lives. And in their mind, they're, you know, you might picture it this way. They're, they're over here, you know, outside the temple, worshiping other gods and doing all sorts of other things. They had even gone so far as to offering their, their infants um, up in sacrifice. But then they want to come over here to the temple and, and go through the gates and kind of act like, here I am, Lord. I'm here to worship you. You know, and there's a divided loyalty. And so that's why this message is a deceptive message. Because in their words, in the words of the priests at that time, and the leaders of that time, the people of that time, let's go to the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. And, and Jeremiah says those are deceptive words. The Lord says those are deceptive words. Don't listen to those words. They are not true. In order to once again be the temple of the Lord, they're going to have to do what? What are they going to have to do before they can really say that and it be an honest phrase? Repent, right? They're going to have to get rid of all that stuff in their life and come back to God and God will come to them and they can dwell in this place and all the promises of the Lord will be fulfilled and that truly will be the temple of the Lord. But for now, those words are deceptive. Look at verse 5. He says, for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow, you know, that's not outer space aliens, obviously. Um, someone in my family asked me that question recently, so that's why I bring it up. Um, the orphan, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your ruin. Then I will let you dwell in this place, right? In the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely? What does that sound like? It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like the Ten Commandments, doesn't it? You know, they're, they're breaking all of these covenant commands. Offer sacrifices to Baal. Walk after other gods that you have not known. 
and and known in in Jeremiah, most of the Old Testament has a, a lot to do with just not just um, intellectual knowledge, but it's relational. It's to know somebody, and then to come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, "We are delivered." That you may do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in, in your sight? Behold, I, even I have seen it, declares the Lord. So the message is obviously, you know, true. And I'm, I'm sure it wasn't easy for someone to, to really consider these ideas. Um, even as, as Jeremiah is speaking these things, uh, we have this man who is would be seen as kind of an outsider, um, and, and he's standing out here. He's bringing a message that is not what they want to hear. It is com- is against everybody. You can imagine everybody kind of in in the same. How would you phrase that? Kind of working together and thinking together and saying, "Hey, we're right. We're doing the right things. We're you know, yes, we're worshiping these other gods, but you know, we're giving God His due. We're we're doing what we need to do. We're coming to this place. We're offering sacrifices. We're." Worshiping him, we have priests, you know, we're walking through the gates and, and we're humbling ourselves before the Lord while all along their life is in ruins. <laughs> you know, their life is an abomination to God. The things that they're doing in everyday life is against the will of God. But somehow they've justified this idea that they can just come to the house and, and be cleansed, be delivered. And Jeremiah is, is telling them what they need to hear. And I imagine it wasn't easy. <laughs> and I imagine that he didn't want to do that. And I imagine that that was not where he wanted to be. <laughs> this was not something that was a popular message. Um, it's easy when you want to give a good message, right? If you want to get up and you want to say something that's, that's wholesome and good, and you jump up there and you say, guess what? I've got wonderful news. You know, you can't wait to proclaim it. But some of the difficult stuff is hard to proclaim. It's hard to go before a people and say, listen. Y'all are in the wrong. And if you don't straighten up, there's going to be consequences. And Jeremiah has been given that kind of work, that kind of mission throughout his entire life. I'm sure it's hard. But look what he says in verse 27. This one's what makes it even harder. <laughs> so you can imagine that being difficult, all right? That's, that's hard enough. Nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news, um, even if it's their own doing. He does. Nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news. But this is what makes it more difficult in verse 27. He says, you shall speak all these words to them, you know, over and over, all these words, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer you. Forty years. (laughs) Jeremiah preached for 40 years. And guess what? Nothing. I mean, how discouraging can that be? You know, um, you would expect some kind of change. You would expect something to happen. But the people of Israel continue doing their thing and, and doing what they want to do. And, 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 and Jeremiah just keeps preaching to them for all this time and alone, you know, and it's got to be discouraging. So let's talk a little bit about Jeremiah's mental health for a moment, because I think that's something that we don't talk about much um, in the church. You know, I don't know why it's such a taboo topic. Um, but it's such a reality, you know, um, there is a physical health, right? We, we suffer from physical ailments. We understand what that means. Um, but do we, do we suffer mentally? Do we suffer mentally? Has anybody suffered from discouragement or anxiety or stress or depression? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> of course, one of the things you learn when you when you work with people, and, and you know, my major in school was psychology, so you know, mental health has always been kind of close and mentally in my mind. 
you know, because I've, I've always enjoyed studying that. Um, but one of the things you learn is sometimes as much as you want to say, you know, um, just stand up and, and get to work and get back to business. Um, is it always that easy? It's. Yeah. Well, OK. <laughs> And, and sometimes there's just, you know, you get in these places where you cannot seem to, to get out, right? I mean, you just feel like it's, um, I always described it as a, a, um, the, the ever-looming black cloud. Anybody ever experienced that? <laughs> I mean, it's like, ah, it just won't go away, you know? And, and you, you want to have, you, you continue doing what you need to do, but you're doing it in kind of a, um, a daze, you know, you just feel like, oh, I just cannot shake this. It's a reality, but it's a lot of it comes from, um, you know, whatever. There could be a chemical imbalance. There could be something going on there. There's certainly, a, that's certainly reality. But life can be burdensome, and it is a challenge. And I think one of the messages that we get from Jeremiah is here's a man of God who suffers from these things. And I think that that helps us to understand that, you know, God understands that um, the human frailty involves mental suffering as well. Um, let's go ahead and talk about this a little bit and we'll kind of work our way through it. I think it's an important point that comes from Jeremiah's leadership is as a leader, he's going to suffer. He's going to have anxiety. He's going to have stress. He's going to have times of, of loneliness. So look at chapter 15, if you will, if you want to turn to chapter 15. This is kind of Jeremiah's dialogue with the Lord, and and um, the Lord is talking about the people and their condemnation, and and you know mothers are going to mourn for their for their youth, and and so on and so forth. And, and Jeremiah responds this way: He says, "Woe to me and my mother." <laughs> you know, what about my mother? Right? I mean, it, we, it doesn't talk about his mom. He must have been, you know, um, in contact somehow with his mother. He was very young when he began his ministry. But by the time we get through the book, we think everybody's abandoning him. You know, what about his mom? How does he, how does she feel about the things that are going on with him? And, and then he says that you have borne me as a man of strife, a man of contention to all the land. I have, I have not lent, nor have men lent money to me, yet everyone curses me. <laughs> you know, does this sound like a man that's really gung ho and excited about the ministry? <laughs> He's really going through some stuff. And it's important for us to embrace that. It, it's a reality of life. It's a reality of life. If you're going to deal with people, you have to recognize that people go through stuff. And, and just because you're in a good mood doesn't mean everybody else is. Right? And we have to be aware of the fact that people go through difficult times. Look at verse 15. He says, um, You who know, O Lord... Remember me, take notice of me, take vengeance for me on my persecutors. Do not, in view of your patience, take me away. Know that for your sake, I endure reproach. Your words were found and, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart. And I have been called by your name. That's Kind of what was mentioned before, that that's, that is where he finds comfort. He finds comfort in, in the words of the Lord, but he still has times of, of, of darkness and despair. He says, O Lord God of hosts, I did not sit in the circle of merry makers, nor did I exalt. Because of your hand upon me, I sat alone. I sat alone. For you filled me with indignation. He says, why, why has my pain been perpetual in my wound, incurable, refusing to be healed. Will you indeed be to me like a deceptive stream with water that is unreliable? What does that What does that feel like to you? Just that those words. What would it be like? Um, you know, because I grew up in the country, and when we grew up with lots of rivers. Okay, I know. I know you don't understand that. All right, y'all from Monahans. Um, but uh, we had rivers everywhere. And not only do we have rivers, but they were all headwaters, which means they were all from, you know, from the ground. That's where they started. And the Oasis River came up in, in Campwood, Texas, and went down to the Gulf of Mexico when it became 
incredibly nasty and you wouldn't even want to swim in it. But, but when it comes up out of the ground, it's crystal clear and it's beautiful, but you can't drink it. The water's got bacteria in it. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. But if you can find the streams that are feeding the water, and what you find is literally from the rock, water flowing in streams, you can drink that because it has never seen the air. That's the first time it has come out from under the ground. There's limestone, ca- I know this sounds kind of absurd. There's limestone caverns everywhere. In fact, my parents' property, they get water from a limestone stream that feeds the Oasis River. It does not filtered. It goes straight from the ground to the tap and it is amazing. Okay. It is lime filtered water. It's amazing. If you're lucky enough, you can find those. And so when we would tromp up and down the river, you know, miles and miles of hiking and things, you know, and, and you're thirsty, okay, and you're looking for water, you have to be very careful where you find it because it's going to be a miserable next several hours if you drink out of the river. Um, but if you can find one of those streams, it, it can be uh, refreshing and good. But there's something deceptive about the clarity of the water. Because it looks good on the outside, but when you drink it, it makes you miserable for, for hours, okay? And so you look for the stream. So that's kind of how I see this, is what Jeremiah is feeling is, is, you know, has the Lord forgotten him? When will his wounds be healed? And we're talking about mental anguish and, and issues of, of the mind. Are they incurable? Will, will God refuse to take care and heal him? Is God acting like a deceptive stream, promising one thing but providing something else and just giving more anguish and and distress? Is that how God is dealing with him? Of course not, right? I mean, obviously not. But that's where that's where he is right now. That's the moment where he is in this place of of despair and difficulty. Now, Jeremiah 20. We're going to jump over to chapter 20 real quick and look at verses 7 and 10. These are very popular words. I'm sure you've heard them before. But it kind of gives us the pinnacle of his his moment where he has to make a serious decision. He has to make a, a serious commitment, knowing what he knows, experiencing what he's experienced. And look at verse um, seven. He says, oh, Lord, you have you have deceived me and, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach. Right? And and, and all the day long desertion. He says, but, in verse 9, if I say I will not remember him, this is speaking of Jeremiah, his inner dialogue about his, his mission, his work, his calling. If I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart, it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I'm weary of holding it in and I cannot endure it. For I have heard the whispering of many, terror on every side, denounce him. Yes, let us denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for my fall. Say, perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and and take our revenge on him. (laughs) That's that's powerful, isn't it? I think it's powerful because it's so incredibly relatable. You know, we we kind of get a um, a jaded view (laughs) of how things are, you know, and we we think, well, you know, if you do the work of the Lord and and you speak the words of the Lord and you do the will of the Lord, it's just going to be great for you. Everything is going to be awesome. Your life is going to be great. Your work is going to be great. Your family life is going to be great. Everything's going to be wonderful. And I'm not saying that it, it it's not going to be. I'm just saying that that's kind of our our you know genie in a bottle, our our instant pill to make everything good. And then we we find words like this and we think, well. You know, this servant of the Lord was incredibly faithful. Yes, sir. I was going to say to me, the most encouraging, you know, is, you know, you read Jeremiah and it's kind of a down. Yeah. You know, you, you read it and you think, you know, you don't get it. It's, it's not exactly the most uplifting thing in the world to read. But at the same time, you have to look at it like this. It's encouraging to know that even the strongest prophets were discouraged. Yeah, that's right. 
that we're not alone when we get discouraged. That's right. Look at what happened with Job. No. Mm-hmm. It's the same kind of thing. It's not necessarily a failure on our part to accept the fact that there are going to be times when we're extremely discouraged because even the strongest prophets in the Bible got discouraged and were right. afraid, by the way, from their language to let God know that they were discouraged. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You know, people think that, well, I'm going to have to, you know, I have to be happy all the time or it's a sign of weakness in my faith. No, not necessarily. Right. That's right. You know, sometimes it gets pretty difficult. That's right. You know, it was difficult for Jeremiah here and you know, it just shows that even the strongest of the strongest mm-hmm. get pretty discouraged at times. Yeah. Understandably so of what he was going through. But to me that's encouraging to know that because I know there have been times where I get frustrated. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a sign of weakness, it's just a sign of being human. Yes. Exactly. And, and, and working through it. Exactly. Exactly. And and uh, thank you for those points. Those are great points. And I, I was hoping that's what was coming out of that was that Yes, he's discouraged, but that then again, that can be an encouragement, just the same. You know, um, first, we know there's no perfect person, you know, other than Jesus, you know, um, but even in parenting, you know, has has anybody suddenly become incredibly frustrated with their kids to where they lash out? Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> Never. Right. And, and, you know, our kids sometimes are surprised, right? They're kind of surprised. That, shh, OK, <laughs> the stories for later. Okay, and, uh, and, and they're a little shocked sometimes, but it's like, you know, parents get discouraged and we get frustrated and we, we say things we probably shouldn't say, but we're human and, and we make these kinds of mistakes. Um, but I think acknowledging that is incredibly important. And I think that's one of the things when you read Jeremiah that's so, um, even though, like Joe said, it, it can feel like a downer, it lifts you up to know, oh, okay. All right, we this this is a reality, you know. It's not just me, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm not. It's not just me, but we all go through this during these times of difficulties. So we we certainly put Jeremiah in the class of great leaders, right? I mean, there's no doubt. He he was he was he followed the authority of the Lord. He was submissive to the Lord. He obeyed the Lord. He did everything he was asked to do, and but yet he. He had no followers. Nobody was following him. Even his friends, he says, are, are waiting for him to mess up and fall. Right? I mean, you can imagine them praying to, to have Jeremiah fall and, and just stop talking. You know, Jeremiah, stop. You know, you're making a fool of yourself. He became a reproach amongst his people. Um, in fact, Jewish tradition says that later, um, after Babylonian captivity, we, we kind of know that Jeremiah uh, went, but he was allowed to go free by Nebuchadnezzar for, for a reason. And uh, there were a group of, um, of Jewish people who had fled uh, into the Egyptian territory. And when they found Jeremiah having left Babylon, um, Jewish tradition says it's not scripture, but that's kind of how they've picked up on these eyes that the Talmud has some doctrine about it, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But they stoned him to death is what, what they say. Um, now that we know that there were many attempts at his life during his time. He's thrown into a pit. You know, they tried to kill him on many occasions. They wished him to be dead. Uh, but nonetheless, he was a leader. Now, if you were to tell somebody that's what leadership looked like, what, what would you what would they say? I want to be a leader, okay? <laughs> but we just don't, it is not a side of leadership that we generally see, but biblical leadership certainly has that side to it. Now let's think about that for a minute. He was a leader, but he had no followers. Um, if we are going to measure the quality of a person's leadership based on how many people follow them, talking about biblical leadership. So if we're going to measure the quality of their leadership based on how many people follow them, how would Jeremiah rank? If zero, right? If, if that's the, if that is what we're judging them on. Okay. Now, who else do we know that was a, an incredible leader, but had very few followers? A very important per character in history. <laughs> What's that? Christ. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, how often did he preach to a group of leaders, 
you know, condemning them for their false teachings and their false shepherding. But at the end, when he ascends, you remember in the book of Acts, how many people were with with the, um, at this point, the 11, right? Because Judas had um, killed himself. And so we have the 11 plus about 120 is what Luke tells us. And, and that was pretty much it. That was that circle of faithful disciples. And the rest of them continue following the the leaders of Israel. So we're thinking about all these Israelites, all these Jews that heard Jesus preach, that heard Jesus, that knew about Jesus. And these people are all rejecting Jesus and they're following the leaders of Israel. So they have a great big following. Jesus has kind of a handful of faithful followers. If we were going to measure the quality of Jesus's leadership based on how many people followed him, how would Jesus look? Wouldn't look good. But that's not the deciding factor. <laughs> that's not what de- determines a person's quality of leadership. Yeah, right. Right. Yes, I mean, we can certainly... That's right. Yep. No. <laughs> yes. Right. That's right. Any any thoughts or comments, questions on that? I want to talk a little bit about God's grace in Jeremiah. We don't have a lot of time, but if we can at least brush on it, I think it would be helpful. This, this book does have a message of hope, by the way. Um, is, there, is there anything, any comments on that? All right. If you want to turn to Jeremiah 31, you're probably familiar with this passage. I'm just going to read through it, and um, it pretty much speaks for itself. But this is the message that God gives, that even though, and here's the, here's the grace part, Israel was unfaithful. They will go into captivity. They would not listen to his prophet. They would not listen to the words of warning. God will send them off to Babylonian captivity. But despite their unfaithfulness, God will remain faithful to his promise. And so Jeremiah 31 is the glimmer of hope that we have in the story that affects us. It says, starting in verse 27, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man. Now remember, these these lands are being wiped out. The northern tribes are already gone. The southern tribes are probably at this point either gone or are about to be gone. And then he says, as I have watched over them to pluck up. Remember the words in chapter 1 of Jeremiah? To break down, to overthrow, to destroy, to bring disaster. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. That was Jeremiah's message, his commission. Verse 29. In those days, they will say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Behold, verse 31, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers and the day that I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them on their hearts. I will write it. I will be their God. They shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. For the, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That's, that's God's grace. Despite the unfaithfulness of the people of God, God will remain faithful. Any thoughts, comments? Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we are so encouraged father we're so strengthened by the words of your prophet that we are able to to read and understand that during distressing and difficult times father that during times of anxiety that that we we recognize that we're not alone in those things 
that it's part of the human condition that we will experience these things. And as we may strive to serve you in all that we do, we may not find peace in all relationships, but we might find distress. But we know, Father, all in all at the end, that your desire for us is to ultimately have peace. We find that peace, Father, in Jesus. Father, we look to him in the future that we may find hope, that we of the new covenant will recognize that we are a part of a family that may endure suffering, but we have an incredible hope in your son. Father, help us to focus on that hope in times of distress. Help us to recognize, Father, that you are the one who will deliver us in the end. Give us the courage and the strength to persevere. Help us, Father, to be faithful to you in all ways. Help us to embrace the grace that you have extended to us through your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.